Thank you, Jim. We're singing in a couple of our songs about mountains. And I mentioned the mountain that Daniel, our son Daniel, has had to overcome uh, on his journey out to Bethel. A big, big mountain for him. Uh, And maybe you have some mountain uh, in your life that's causing you stress, anxiety, kind of trouble, holding you back from going to where you want to be in your life or where you feel God's... Testing. Testing. Is that any better? Good. (laughs) A mountain (laughs) in your life holding you back. Uh, just dominating uh, your thinking, absorbing all your energy, uh, and making life really tough. And maybe you're sitting there thinking, well, yeah, I can identify what that mountain is. I've got a picture of um, Mount Everest, the biggest mountain, the tallest mountain in our world. Um, And actually, very few people, uh, in relative terms, ever attempt to scale that mountain. But, you know, unless we attempt to scale our mountains, you know, they may dominate and and grind us down and and stop us achieving the things we want to do and God would have us do in our lives. Back at the weekend um, with uh, the males, Dave and Heather Mayle, they kind of painted a picture about a a kind of more uh, common mountain that we all face as Christians in Scotland. The fact that... Uh, Probably today, about 8% of the population will be in church. Maybe a third of the population might go to church once or twice during the year. Alongside those 8% uh, uh, might go occasionally or have been to church in the past. So for them, maybe going to church might be a possibility from time to time. Uh, But then the two-thirds of the population who never go to church, apart from maybe a wedding or a funeral, uh, and really, like on a Sunday morning, that is just not on their agenda. Uh, And in actual fact, that 60%, 66% might be a lot bigger. Uh, The estimates of uh, the number of born-again believers uh, in Scotland maybe is kind of around about 2 or 3% of the population uh, and so in kingdom terms, that's a huge mountain, perhaps 97, 98% of the population of Scotland uh, who needs to make a personal response to Jesus to become his disciples, to be filled with his Holy Spirit, and to become part of, of his church uh, and part of his kingdom. Huge mountain that we face. And that was really what we were thinking about uh, last weekend and challenged in our thinking as to how we look at that and how we might work alongside the Lord to bring a change in that situation. Now, back in Zechariah's time, uh, they had a a mountain that they faced. Uh, We don't know for sure. It doesn't really explain what the mountain was, but it could have been the immensity and power uh, of the Persian Empire, which was in charge in those days. It was the power in the land. It was Uh, in charge of the whole of the known world uh, at that time. Could also have been, could have pictured the the strength of opposition that they were facing directly in Jerusalem to the rebuilding of the temple, which was what they were in the business of doing uh, at God's instruction at that time. And in contrast to these mountains that they faced, the returning remnant were weak and vulnerable Having lived in exile for 70 years after the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in the past, the glory days of the kings, particularly David and Solomon, were long gone. And all the people could hope for were small things. No one had any expectation of anything more significant than that, including, it seemed, the prophets at that time. And the prophet here, Zechariah, even he was asleep. Back in those days, the prophet Zechariah uh, was woken by an angel who delivered to him an awesome vision 
of a golden lampstand with seven lights fed by seven channels and with an olive tree on either side. And I've got a picture of it up there on the screens just to give you a kind of picture in your mind of what that would have looked like to Zechariah. And this most probably represents a picture of the temple uh, because it's a picture of the golden menorah. If you visit Jerusalem today, which we had the opportunity to do about four years ago, there is uh, a wonderful golden menorah. It's a huge thing. I don't know how uh, big it is, but it's massive, very near to the, to the western wall, the Wailing Wall. Uh, and, of course, they had one of these in the old days in the temple, which, of course, is not there now. Uh, and it was always filled with olive oil. Um, lit every night to provide light for the temple during the hours of darkness. Uh, we're told in the passage that the olive trees on either side are, um, how does it put it? The two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. And uh, for their context at that time, clearly that was um, Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, and Joshua, the high priest. Uh, these were the two uh, human beings, the few people that had been anointing specifically to lead the people at that time. As for the mighty mountain that they faced, uh, before the Spirit empowered Zerubbabel, it would become level ground. It would not only no longer be a mountain, there wouldn't be any evidence of it at all, that it had even ever existed. Uh, the promise is given that Zerubbabel will be the one who will lead the people to complete the temple. And indeed, the capstone for the temple was put in place just four years later as the temple was finished. Uh, and this temple, with some restoration work and extensions by Herod sometime later, stood right through to the time of Jesus. Uh, it was only ultimately destroyed by the Roman Empire in 70 AD, as Jesus himself predicted um, during his uh, ministry here. Uh, and the work on the temple may have been slow. At times, what was being achieved might have seemed to them small. But the people led by Zerubbabel and empowered by the Spirit of God we're going to achieve God's plan. For when God's involved, the obstacles become like nothing. And so his work of rebuilding became easy. Because the mountains were wiped out. Now while this vision had great relevance for the people then, and encouraged them to proceed in the work that they were engaged in, uh, with the, that is the completion of the temple. Uh, I'm sure we can clearly see, and maybe as you read the passage earlier, you kind of saw uh, a picture there of a further fulfillment of this prophecy in the time of Jesus. Uh, once again at that time, which would have been a, a few hundred years later, God, God's people had fallen on hard times. Now it was no longer the Persians who were in charge, it was the Romans who were in charge. Uh, they were the dominant empire uh, in Jesus' day. Uh, the spiritual leaders of God's people, uh, the high priests, uh, were spiritually dry and were leading the people astray into legalism. Uh, the temple was no longer the light of the world that it had been. The Spirit of God had long departed and the word of the Lord was no longer heard in the land. And the prophets were asleep. There hadn't been a prophet since Malachi. This time, it was John the Baptist who was filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. And he was given a new vision by the Lord. He was a voice of one calling in the desert. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, and every mountain and hill brought 
low. The circumstances for the arrival of Jesus into our world were far from auspicious. Uh, in the wider uh, world, Roman polytheism dominated the spirituality of the world at that time. Uh, the local ruler, Herod the Great, was a brutal dictator. Uh, there was the corruption within the Jewish spiritual leaders at that time. And so there were many mighty, mighty mountains around when Jesus was born. Uh, like John the Baptist, he was filled with the Holy Spirit at his baptism. Uh, he was descended from this man in Zechariah's uh, chapter here in his whole book, Zerubbabel. If you go and read the genealogies, you can see the, the name of Zerubbabel in there uh, as one of uh, Jesus' uh, predecessors, ancestors. Jesus, of course, also was God's son. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so his very nature was divine in origin. Yet this was something that began small. A weak, helpless baby uh, who became, like his father, a, a poor, ordinary carpenter. And then for three short years, a penniless, wandering rabbi. And these small things in the life of Jesus were despised by most people in the land at that time. Immediately following his birth, of course, Herod, fearing the prophecies that he had heard about, planned to murder him. And yet he lived and he taught, and he healed people, most of all in the three years at the end of his 30 years, 33 years of life before his death on the cross. The builders at that time rejected him, but he became the capstone. The second temple of Zerubbabel, as I said earlier, would last only a few more decades, but it had already been replaced by a more perfect temple, producing a pure light, and that light was Jesus. Whereas just in Zechariah's day, it was not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Uh, and that is clearer in Jesus' life that, than in any place uh, in the whole of the scriptures. Now, could it be that we live in days like those of Joshua and Zerubbabel today? Uh, certainly, I think that's true in the West, at least. Uh, the mountain of secularism is all pervasive and leads to resistance to the purposes of God in our nation and in the wider Western world. In other parts of the world where there's more life in the church and growth in the church at unprecedented rates, there is unprecedented persecution against the church. Uh, I think they say that there were more Christian martyrs in the 20th century than the previous 19 centuries from the days of Jesus. And so we have the might and power of secularism. We've seen that in communism. We now have it in terrorism and every other ism that has risen against the purposes of God. And you contrast that with the weakness and decline of the church in Western culture. In a little island like Collinsey, down to three people in the Baptist church and four people in the church of Scotland. The glory days of the early church and of past revivals are over, and all we see is small things. And as in those days, it seems at times like the prophets uh, have fallen asleep. And so we like that, the days of Zechariah. We need the prophets to awake. We need people like Zechariah, people like John the Baptist to bring us new visions of what God is doing in our time and to apply the word of the Lord to the challenges faced by God's people today. And we see a little bit 
of that in the church, springing up in the church, organizations like the Glasgow Prophetic Center, the prophetic word of God coming back to speak to the people of God. Our world and our nation and our communities need the church to be restored because the church is the the hope uh, of the world. So that it becomes like that seven light golden lampstand fueled by the oil of God's spirit as in the vision that we saw earlier or heard earlier that was given to Zechariah. And what's clearly evident in this chapter is the, the word of God and the spirit of God working together. We had the word coming to the prophet and being delivered as a message to the people. The spirit of God evident in the oil that was coursing through that golden lampstand. And the church needs both. I don't know if many of you are familiar with the little statement that uh, a Bible teacher called Stephen, Stephen Alford shared uh, at one point. Uh, he said that if we have all of the word, but no spirit, uh, then we dry up. And that's always been a little bit of the danger in the evangelical community. Uh, If you have all spirit, but no word, then the danger is you blow up. That's always been the danger in what we would call the charismatic, maybe, or Pentecostal churches. But when you have the spirit and the word together, then God's people grow up. Because it's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Just as with Joshua and Zerubbabel, and just as with John the Baptist and with Jesus, God does not rely on human might and power. He didn't do things in those days either by the Persian Empire or by the uh, Roman Empire. They were kind of side characters in the drama that unfolded. His spirit is more than sufficient. And he is working to restore his temple, which, of course, in our age, is the church by his own means. And if we rely overly on our human cleverness and our ingenuity, then we will most likely get nowhere. But if we watch out to see where God himself is working by his Spirit, and we join him there, Uh, then we will see the most amazing things happening. And I'm sure many of us have seen small things in our day. And and we shouldn't despise these small things. We should rejoice in these small things. And of course, when I was thinking about that, uh, just kind of uh, preparing earlier on this morning, I, of course, came back to my mind our Polish friends down in Clyde Bank. And if there was ever a case of no human power involved whatsoever, it was theirs. There weren't any people involved. None of them were born-again believers until God showed up, encouraged them to read his word. They bought Bibles, Polish Bibles, through Amazon, started to read the word. Uh, The Holy Spirit came and, and brought them to new spiritual life in Christ. And, of course, it was such a privilege for us back in January, to baptize those eight dear people here in our own church and to celebrate what seemed to be a small thing. But what is God going to do amongst that small community in Clyde Bank? You know, we're excited to see what he will do there. The Christian author, Francis Schaeffer, uh, wrote, In God's sight, there are no little people and no little places. The world loves the sensational and stunning, but God loves to work through the ordinary and the insignificant. And God often uses little things and seemingly unimportant people to display his love and his grace and his glory to the world. Now, we do, of course, need to have the capstone in place. 
Jesus must be our founding principle and our focal point. Uh, those of you who came to our anniversary services uh, towards the end of January, uh, our guest speaker was Edwin Gunn, who's I know familiar to a lot of people, retired Baptist minister, used to be the minister at uh, Queen's Park Baptist Church. And it was a simple message Edwin brought. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Uh, Jesus has to be the beginning and the middle and the end of all that we do because he is the capstone. If we don't have Jesus as the capstone in our temple, if you don't have a capstone in your building, it collapses. If we don't have Jesus as the capstone in our temple, it will collapse. We need Jesus. Not only his example, not only his teaching, but his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and his sending of the Holy Spirit to his people. For it is not by might nor power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. And so that's the great hope for us as we look at the mountain of secularism and the lack of belief in Scotland today and in the wider Western world. But what's true for the church and as for us together is true for individuals too, for individual disciples. Whatever the mountain you face in your life today that's dominating your thinking, causing you worry and stress, keeping you awake at night, whatever that mountain is, whether it's something in a relationship that you have, whether it's something in your work situation, whether it's an issue in your health, whether it's in the ministry that you have, wherever that might be, whatever the mountain is, we should fix our eyes on Jesus. We should combine word and spirit. We need as believers to be marinated in the word of God. We need to be filled with the Spirit of God. Every single one of us needs to be a mini menorah with the channels of uh, God's Holy Spirit coursing through our veins. And we should not despise the small things. And maybe sometimes in our eyes, you know, we are the small thing. But God can use small things, no matter how insignificant or lacking in gifting you feel, God uses the small thing. And that small thing can include you, even if you face a huge mountain, because in God's eyes, that mountain is nothing. For indeed, as Paul taught, I can do everything the Lord says, everything, through the one who I give strength to. And we receive strength through his word and through his spirit. And we all know the source of that strength. For it is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we... Uh, are so excited by uh, the stories that Zechariah shares in his book. They may be detached from our time by two and a half thousand years, and the circumstances that he and the people at that time faced may be very different from what we face in our lives today. And yet there's that resonance, uh, too, with the idea of the mountains that we face, which we think, how can I scale that mountain? It's just too big. I can't do this. And that's right. We can't on our own. But Lord, we know that with you, all things are possible. And Lord, we pray, my prayer would be for every single person here today, that you would minister into their hearts a real belief, a sense that the mountain they face today will be tomorrow or next week or whenever it, it, it is that you plan to bring it down like level ground 
And that person will wonder, why did I ever worry about that thing? Because God was in charge. Lord, just pull down the mountains that we face in our lives. Release us to be the people that you would have us be. Help us not to detract from what you are doing by just saying that's a small thing, that I am just a small person because the small people, the small uh, things, the small places can be mighty uh, in your hands, empowered by your spirit. And so, Lord, just speak into our hearts this morning by your word, we pray. In Jesus' name.